Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Mark Green here, the Diabetes Diet Guy from DiabetesDietGuy.com. Now today we are talking about what you can eat with type 2 diabetes. Now this is off the back of a previous video I did where my friend pointed out to me that one of my more popular videos was um, what you can eat for breakfast with type 2 diabetes. So I thought we'd take it to the next level today and actually explain what someone with type 2 diabetes can actually eat day to day to help manage their blood sugar levels. Now, this is the sort of thing that we talk about an awful lot on the website, diabetesdiaguide.com, where it's all there for you, free information, lots of different blogs. So if you haven't done so already, head over there and check it out because we expand on all the subjects we're gonna talk about today. If you prefer to have it all there in order, laid out for you with a diet plan, showing exactly what to do, and we also have programs available, check out the programs page. Or if you prefer more of a personalized touch, working on a one-to-one -one basis, we also offer consultancy services where you get specialist dietitian input on a one-to-one -one basis. Anyway, enough of the intros. Let's get into the video because we have an awful lot to get through. So the first thing to emphasize is with type two diabetes, we kind of moved away from that whole diabetes diet thing and then instead actually started to realize that the advice we're giving is actually very similar just to the healthy eating guidelines we give to the general population. Now, they are massively understood anyway, but that's a whole different story. But when you start breaking things down, actually most of the advice regarding just general healthy eating principles and healthy living principles are very, very applicable to managing type two diabetes and they help to address the underlying cause of the disease, which tends to be that you're carrying a bit too much fat, um, either uh, visibly, so subcutaneously, or viscerally, which means inside around the organs, around the liver, the pancreas, and around the cells of the body, which makes your insulin in your body, which helps lower your glucose levels, not work as well. So the treatment is to lose weight, lose the fat, and try and get as fit as possible, and that will ultimately help your body control your glucose levels much better, like it once did before, prior to the diagnosis of diabetes. But anyway, so we've moved away from the diabetes diet, but of course, there are certain caveats that we do need to consider with regards to eating for type two diabetes, particularly if you're not getting particularly active, or there's some other elements that are missing from the diet. In which case we need to start personalizing things and having an appreciation of the foods that do affect your blood sugars and the foods that don't affect your blood sugars and ones that are good for weight loss and ones that aren't so good for weight loss really helps you put it into the context of your own management plan. So that's very important. So as you can see on the board here, as per usual, we've listed out some things. One, to help prompt me, because it's always hard to do it just off the top of your head. And two, also just to lay out a rough plan as what we're gonna talk about. So let's jump right in. Number one, carbohydrates affect blood sugar levels. So if you don't know where carbohydrates are in your diet, we find them in lots of different places. And the reason we're interested in carbohydrates is because it is the carbohydrates that affect your blood glucose levels. They affect my blood glucose levels without diabetes, they affect everyone's blood glucose levels. But the problem is in diabetes, there's potential to have too high blood glucose levels. So too many carbohydrates can result in too high a blood glucose level. It doesn't mean carbohydrates are bad. It means your body is unable to process them like someone without diabetes. So don't think carbohydrates are the bad thing here. It's about treating the situation, which is these can cause a high blood glucose level, but the reason they can do that is inside of you. So with type two diabetes, like I say, if you're treating the underlying problem, which is shifting that fat around the organs, that will help you tolerate these once again. But nonetheless, let's assume that hasn't happened. Knowing where the carbohydrates in your diet and where the potential for spikes come from is very important. So we have them in lots of different food groups. The first is starch. So starchy foods like bread, pasta, rice, potato, oats, all these foods are turned into glucose when you eat them. So therefore they have a chance or potential to spike your blood glucose levels. So already that's a, that's a sign that we might need to think about how much of these are we having. The other place that we find carbohydrates in the diet is sugar. Sugar is a carbohydrate. It's not a separate thing. It's a carbohydrate of which we have two types of sugar. We have processed sugars like um, cakes, biscuits, sweets, um, but also things that are also highly processed like juices and jams and marmalades, sugary drinks. And we also have um, natural sugars, which you find in fruit, 
and also in a small amount in your dairy products, um, milk and yogurt, and that sugar is called lactose. So anything that ends in O's means sugar. Lactose, glucose, fructose, all mean sugar. And then also to a smaller extent as well, in some of your legumes, beans, pulses, lentils, chickpeas, they have some carbohydrates, but their primary nutrient is protein, but there is some carbohydrates there. So we have carbohydrates in lots of different places. So carbohydrates is really an umbrella term, but all of these foods have potential to increase your blood glucose levels, some less than others. Um, so the starch and the processed sugars are the big hitters there. So if you're having a problem with your blood glucose levels, particularly after meals, it's more than likely gonna be related to the starch or the sugar. Fruit to a certain extent, but there's not a whole lot of starch, uh, there's not a whole lot of sugar in fruits comparative to the amount of carbohydrate and starch and processed sugars, and the same for legumes. So really, actually, these are rarely the problem in terms of the natural sugars and the natural starch and legumes, and it's more the starchy foods and the sugary foods from the processed sources that are the big problem. Number two, knowing the foods that do not affect your blood glucose levels. So now we know where the carbohydrates are in the diet, so the foods that affect your blood glucose levels, but there's lots of different foods in our diet that go beyond carbohydrates. We have protein and fats, for example. So knowing the foods that do not affect your blood glucose levels is very important because then we can start to migrate from big portions of carbohydrates to modest portions of carbohydrates, which then we replace with um, the foods that do not affect your blood glucose levels, which is protein foods, meat, fish, eggs, nuts, seeds, and vegetables and salad. Now vegetables and salad have a very small amount of carbohydrate. Some have a bit more like root veg, but again, we're kind of nitpicking with that. So for example, carrots have 15 grams of carbohydrate per 100 grams. Let's put that into perspective though. Rice has 80 grams per 100 grams. So there is a tremendous disconnect between the two. Starchy foods have much more than those root vegetables and carrots and parsnips. That's, they're the king of the vegetable world. They have the most possible carbohydrate you can get in a vegetable pretty much. So everything else is much less. So if you're living in the vegetable and protein world and moderating the amount of carbohydrate you're having, you're giving yourself a good chance of controlling your blood glucose levels after a meal. Adding on to that as well, because type two diabetes for the majority of people is driven by having too much fat around the organs and carrying too much weight, we don't wanna be snacking and eating too many high fat, high calorie foods unless we're compensating by reducing the amount of food that you're having elsewhere. So ideally choosing more lean proteins, and by lean we mean lower fat, so chicken, turkey, reduced fat mints, um, there are certain cuts of beef as well that are lower fat, don't get me wrong, having a steak once a week isn't gonna be the end of the world. Um, eggs, pretty lean, there's a high fat content, if you have the yolk but you know it's relative to how many you have i wouldn't worry too much about eggs and then having lots of vegetables and salads so ideally this will be a half of the plate and this helps to reduce your risk of things like cardiovascular disease um, gastrointestinal problems um, obesity the list goes on and on and on there is just so many benefits when you look at the evidence helps to give you lots of vitamins and minerals and helps to top up your fiber which we should be getting 30 grams a day and generally in the UK we do well to get even 12 grams a day so we are massively deficient in fiber um, so ideally having more of these less of the carbohydrates doesn't mean you should cut them out entirely because there are nutrients there but you know, it's also relative to how active you're being and generally what your lifestyle is looking like. So we need to apply this individually, which is the sort of thing that we do on our program and also in our consultancy services. It's hard to do it just in a video. Number three, portions. So then tagging onto that, we can look at the portions of food and not just the actual amount on your plate, because obviously if you're overeating and you're having big portions, it's gonna be a problem. Even if it's healthy food, you can overeat with healthy food, particularly if that food outweighs the amount of activity you're doing and therefore you go over your calorie requirements and you will gain weight. But what we're more specifically speaking about is the distribution of the different foods on your plate. So if you're someone like I was when I was growing up, where you'd have a spaghetti bolognese and you've got you know, almost a full plate of pasta. And then on top of that, you've got another full plate of meat on top of it. And your vegetables is an onion chopped up into it. You're probably not giving yourself the best chance of one, losing weight and addressing the underlying issue of diabetes in the first place, assuming that's why it's come about. And two, preventing a post meal spike because you're having an awful lot of carbohydrates there. So what we wanna do is shift the balance. So that's a good example, actually, that spaghetti bolognese. Instead, you reduce the amount of mint, still have it, of course, 
Otherwise, it would be a weird spaghetti bolognese, um, unless you're vegetarian, in which case you might pimp it out with something else. But nonetheless, reduce the amount of mints, reduce the amount of carbohydrates and starch, and replace it with vegetable alternatives. So you're really bulking out that meal with vegetables. That lowers the carbohydrate intake, it lowers the calorie intake, and ultimately makes the meal a much more well-rounded meal for both healthy living and type two diabetes. Taking it one step further, you can even use vegetable replacements instead of the carbohydrate. So rather than spaghetti, you use things like courgette spaghetti or courgette. Rather than rice, you use things like cauliflower rice, if that's your thing. To be frank, when I've microwaved it, um, it smells a little bit like feet, but you know, each to their own. And if you like it, it can certainly help your blood glucose levels. That's just my preference. It's worth mentioning, if you're taking any diabetes medications, before you start making all these changes, just tie in with your diabetes team just to make sure that if you're playing around with the portions and the distribution on your plate, that there's no considerations that you need to think about with regards to your medications because they might have prescribed them on the assumption that you're gonna keep eating the way you're eating forevermore. And any changes to your diet, particularly with insulin, can result in low blood glucose levels, which can be dangerous. Number four glycemic index. And number four on the list is this thing called the glycemic index. We've probably heard of it or appreciate the principle to some extent. I'm sure you've encountered it somewhere along your diabetes journey. So the glycemic index or the GI just talks about how quickly the carbohydrate containing foods are absorbed in your body when you eat them. So something that is very quickly absorbed like um, white bread, white pasta, white rice, cereal when you add milk to it, anything that's mashed, anything that's juiced, sugar, it's all absorbed very quickly. And obviously the more sugar or glucose or carbohydrate that you have being absorbed at the same time or quickly has more potential for a high glucose level because you've literally got more glucose going into your system at any given time. Whereas if you eat more slowly absorbed foods or carbohydrate containing foods, you've got less chance of a spike because it's more of a drip effect. It takes longer for it to get in. So the amount of carbohydrate entering your system is spread out over time. So changing from those white versions, mashed versions, juice versions, to brown, whole grain, whole meal, oats, overnight oats, um, reducing the total amount of carbohydrates. So rather than cereal, you have a slice of whole meal toast and add a couple of boiled eggs onto it instead. Not only have you then lowered your total carbohydrate, you've also lowered the glycemic index because the whole meal toast is more slowly absorbed compared to the cereal. And also the protein and the fat in the eggs helps to slow down the absorption of the bread that you're also having. And thus you've got much less potential for a spike after your meal. So really utilizing this idea, which we've blogged about multiple times on the website. Again, it's all there, check it out. And even on the YouTube channel as well, maybe have a scroll. We've talked about glycemic index. But nonetheless, these things all feed in together. So there's no one thing that is gonna do this for you. It's really putting all these tools in the toolbox and actually going away and trying to build yourself a new lifestyle and a new routine. And actually, in order to do this effectively, you need to be consistent with it. So trying to do it as much as possible across all the meals in your diet, and then the more consistent you are, the better results you'll get. Don't get me wrong, you can still have the odd day out, you can have some enjoyment in your diet, whether that's a daily small treat, for example, or perhaps you'd rather not have the daily small treat, save them up and have a bit more of a blowout once in a while. But if you're doing the right behaviors and monitoring the carbohydrate intake that you're having, bulking out the plate with lean proteins and lots of veggies, thinking about the distribution of the plate and the overall portion, and also thinking about how quickly are these carbohydrates being absorbed and the types that you're having, you're giving yourself the best chance of actually controlling this diabetes. Now we haven't got exercise on the list, but I will give it a mention. Obviously the more active you can get, the more carbohydrates and the more calories you're gonna burn up, and therefore it only helps the type two diabetes in the long run. Not to mention it also gets you much fitter, and I don't think I need to explain to you that being fitter in life is a bad thing it's only a beneficial thing like the more fit we can be for the longest possible time it's not only going to help your quality of life long term it's also going to help you stay away from problems in terms of your health and any progression of things like type 2 diabetes so there you have it there are four points we need to think about in terms of a type 2 diabetes diet with one tag on thinking about exercise because I've always got to get my exercise plug in. So I hope you found that useful guys. If you did, make sure you subscribe and like the video, really helps us out. 
If you want to know when we publish more videos, then turn on the notifications by hitting the bell. And again, if you haven't done so already, head over to diabetesdietguide.com where we consolidate all this information, many more blogs, and if you need an extra helping hand, check out the programs pages or get in touch about a one-to-one -one consultancy appointment. We'll be more than happy to try and help you um, and hear your story and give you some tips about how to get on top of your diabetes. So thanks for watching guys and we will see you later.